Hello and welcome to our latest iteration of the digital discussions organized by the eEstonia Briefing Center. Today we will talk about how to create your mobility master plan. Uh, my name is Florian Marcus. I'm a digital transformation advisor here at the eEstonia Briefing Center and I'll be your moderator today uh, and sort of host uh, the, the entire conversation. Uh, we have plenty of exciting companies that will tell you about what they do today. But before we focus on the uh, subject at hand for today, I want to do a bit of housekeeping first. So first of all, uh, you are currently on WorkSup where you can scroll through the entire agenda uh, and see all the different speakers, the different topics that they will be talking about. And you will also have noticed that we have a few small changes to our format. So in between, we will have two small panel discussions together with, uh, first of all, my lovely colleague from the Estonia Briefing Center, Annette Numa, and also the different uh, companies that are present here today. Um, also, you will see that there is a Q&A button where you can ask your own questions to the different speakers, and you can also upvote other people's questions if you really want to hear uh, their questions answered as well. So a few words perhaps about the eEstonia Briefing Center before we start. Um, the eEstonia Briefing Center provides all kinds of different uh, services to help uh, your country, your company digitalize together with Estonian know-how. Uh, this goes uh, from fields like e-government and e-health to smart city and mobility solutions, such as the ones that we will see today. Um, of course, also we will send you the recording of today's session uh, via email to all the registered participants. But at the end of uh, this entire event, we will have breakout rooms where you can join the different companies uh, and, and focus on what they do and how they can help you. That part will only be there for our live viewers as a small reward. But yes, the first few presentations and the panel discussions as well will be available recorded afterwards to you. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Her name is Maria Ranama, and she is the head of ITS Estonia. She will tell us about the Estonian vision for smart transport and mobility. Let's take a look. Dear participants, my name is Maria Ranama, and I am the CEO of ITS Estonia which is a collaboration platform in the field of intelligent transportation systems. I would like to welcome you all in the name of Estonian smart mobility and the intelligent transportation community. As you know, the world is facing complicated times right now. We have many challenges ahead of us. Transport has been one of the sectors hit hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic. How do we recover from it? At the same time, the climate questions have become more and more important than ever. European Union has set an ambitious target, 90% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions in transport by 2050. Is it just a nice slogan or is it, or is it really achievable and how to get there? Also, many people are getting seriously injured in traffic daily. EU, EU has created a target vision zero in order to eliminate all traffic fatalities and severe injuries. But how to achieve it? In Estonia, we believe that the answers to these questions are in two words, innovation and digitalization. We have managed to build digital society that really works. Estonia is the only country in the world where 99% of the public services are accessible online 24-7. Also, different public and private databases are constantly exchanging data in seamless and secure way. These are the experiences that we use also in transportation. Let me show you how. Implementing autonomous vehicles has been one of our priorities for many years now. Estonia was one of the first countries in the world to legalize testing of self-driving vehicles on public roads in the year 2016. I'm happy to say that last summer we even made autonomous vehicles part of our public transportation system. We are also piloting on-demand based last mile vehicles right now. Concerning parcel delivery, autonomous vehicles have been an important part of the logistic value chains since 2017. And it is very common in Thailand that if you order yourself a pizza, it will be delivered to you by a robot. 
week ago, Estonia was the first country in Europe to give license to unmanned semi-autonomous vehicle on public streets to operate without any restrictions. For autonomous vehicles, but also overall traffic safety, it is very important to implement smart and digitalized infrastructure, which is able to communicate with the device vehicles and also with the smart devices of users. There are smart pedestrian crosswalks, smart bus stops, even smart road pavement and other technologies in use in order to make the traffic smoother and safer for users. For example, smart pedestrian crosswalk notifies the driver of the pedestrian standing next to the crosswalk. We even have technologies for ensuring the quality of the road pavement during construction works. One of our main targets is to move towards seamless multimodal mobility. We are currently developing and piloting a central mid layer for mobility as a service, or MAS, which integrates together different transport modes and enables several MAS service providers to enter the market. We have also found that since Estonia's countryside in many regions is sparsely populated, it is often much more efficient to use on-demand-based transportation. Pilots in different Estonian regions are ongoing right now. In COVID times, the importance of contactless payment systems have grown rapidly. And I'm happy to say that Estonia is one of the few countries in the world where you can pay your fare directly at the public transport validator with your own bank card. I personally, I really hate searching for the ticket machines while visiting a new city as a tourist. One of the main questions in mobility is how to get people out of their personal cars. We Estonians, we really love our private cars. There is almost one car for every adult citizen in Estonia. So this isn't the easiest task. Therefore, we are integrating micromobility solutions with other transport modes and developing further micromobility infrastructure networks in order to give people alternative options which are comfortable to use, good for their environment and also good for their health. As you already heard, we have managed to make almost all our public services paperless. Now, our next target is automated real-time and paperless logistics. For that, we have implemented several initiatives. Some of them are for digital cargo information exchange, but we have also taken our queues online. Before the year 2011, the poor truck drivers on Estonian and Russian borders had to wait over 60 hours in physical queues. After 2011, when the queues were made digital, the drivers could book a slot and the average border crossing time diminished from 60 to 1.5 hours. You can imagine the difference in CO2 emissions and noise pollution for the locals. Today, we are using similar solutions also in our ports and logistic terminals. In Estonia, we believe that the logistic processes should be real-time visible and automated. And we have developed several solutions for that. You can hear of one of them also on the stage today. In order to make real changes in mobility, it is very important to take in use new innovative technologies and get the most out of data. Since autonomous vehicles are driving and cities are getting more and more connected, then collecting 3D data is crucial. I'm happy to say that Estonia is one of the few countries in the world which is fully covered with digital twin. At the same time, we are using space-based te technologies in order to monitor and detect deformations on bridges, roads, ports, and other large infrastructure objects. We also implement different artificial intelligence-based solutions. As an example, for avoiding obstructions in intersections in our capital Tallinn. Tartu, on the other hand, the second biggest city of Estonia, fully reorganized their public transport network a couple of years ago and used more than 20 different data sources in order to really understand where and how their citizens want to travel. 
It is important to say that many of these solutions have been developed in close cooperation between public and private sector. And this is the reason why ITS Estonia is constantly bringing all these parties together in order to support new collaboration initiatives in national and international level. If you want to hear more in detail about our experiences and lessons learned, then don't hesitate to contact us. I hope that the presentation made you understand a little bit better how Estonian smart mobility and transport sector works. Now, you are going to hear five presentations from companies who are actually behind some of these solutions. Thank you. Uh, well, Maria, thank you so much for, for being uh, here with us on stage. Uh, we already have a couple of questions from the audience as well. Uh, the first one that got the most upvotes is, how much do Scandinavian and Nordic countries cooperate on mobility topics? Um, Estonia might have to learn something from other countries as well, so how does this exchange work? Thank you for an excellent question, and I think this is something I would like to even point out that we have really great and strong Nordic plus cooperation between Estonia and other Nordic countries. Mm. We are jointly doing uh, uh, business development, joint marketing on different uh, world level uh, congresses and so on. So there is very strong collaboration between the different ITS associations in uh, Nordic level. And we also see some, uh, some cooperation between uh, cities um, in, in the Nordics together with Estonia. Uh, I think we have one company later on stage that can tell us a bit more about that uh, as well. Another question that came up uh, in, in the audience uh, questions and answers session was, uh, why do Estonians love cars so much? Um, so, so why do you think that is? And are Estonians alone with this? Or <laughs> what's, your, what's your take on this? Yeah, I think due to our past, the car at one point has been a symbol of status. Uh, at the same time, we are, we are a little bit individual, individualistic people and uh, we love our space. So I think being uh, jointly pressed together in, our, in a crowded plus is not our, our, like, the best experience we could have. Estonians do appreciate their personal space. I think that's a, that's a very fair <laughs> statement uh, to make indeed. Um, another question that, that arose for me was when I look at all of these different technologies and all of the different companies that provide them in Estonia, um, is there a certain reason why Estonia would be a better sort of test bed nation than other countries? And if so, what are they? Yeah, I think uh, the main reason is because we have such a long history in e-government services and also uh, we are used to exchanging data in a seamless and secure way. And this is the reason why we are also open for uh, different uh, new technologies. Also, we have a very agile public sector who is quite quickly uh, able to make legislative changes in order to support innovation. And also, uh, like, if we, if we talk about, as an example, autonomous vehicles, we have four seasons. This is also a good, important point to bring out. Uh, that is true. If you, if you test a car in the Mediterranean, you will mostly only get one season to experience uh, with, with your uh, autonomous vehicles. Um, actually, speaking of that topic, there is one, one question that also popped up. Um, we will talk about this topic later as well, but maybe as an introductory uh, statement already, when will we see self-driving cars on the street? Actually, you can already stay, see self-driving cars on Estonian streets uh, right now. But when we are talking about level five, five uh, fully autonomous vehicles, uh, I think this is the thing that takes time. And the, the question is not so much about technology, because there is already technologies for level five fully autonomous. I think the main question is how to make this technology safe enough. And I think since due to our competencies in blockchain and other cybersecurity technologies, I think Estonia has important uh, part to play in it. I think this also leads us back to the answer of uh, why Estonia is such a good test bed. Um, the technology exists for the most part, uh, so now it's a question of, of ethics, of, of politics, uh, social support, societal support as well. So there are many different things that all have to come together, and I think uh, overall 
people are not scared of accepting a pizza from a delivery robot in Tallinn. They would say, oh, how cool, you know. Some other societies might be a bit more skeptical, you know, what does that robot actually do? What is the purpose of this all? So um, there is a certain openness in Estonia that I've experienced uh, as well. Uh, any final thoughts that you want to share with us? Yeah, I think uh, it's important to bring out that uh, we Estonians are tech-savvy people and we really trust technology. And that is the reason why all our public services are online. So I think this is a thing that uh, goes also for transportation. So I hope to see really new and great uh, uh, initiatives uh, in smart mobility and transportation from Estonia. Very well. Thank you so much for that wonderful overview. And we are heading over to our very first company presentation. It will be done by uh, Tuno Runde, who is the founder and chief of staff at Sixfold. And he will tell us more about what Sixfold does. Let's take a look. This is Alice. Alice is a transport planner at a manufacturing company. Every day, her company sends out hundreds of shipments to her customers. And this is Oliver, the warehouse manager at Alice's company. His warehouse stores both the incoming raw materials and ready-made products before they're shipped out. Their company works with hundreds of carriers that bring in truckloads of raw materials and deliver finished products to customers across Europe. Alice and Oliver use Sixfold to have full visibility over their entire transport network. They can also find out where the dispatched shipments and incoming trucks are and when they're arriving. Despite all their efforts, delays and problems can still occur when transporting goods. Sixfold promptly alerts not just Alice and Oliver, but also lets their customers know. This way, real-time visibility allows plans to be changed before delays become costly. Having this overview allows Oliver to accurately plan inventories and dock scheduling in his warehouses, while Alice can provide a better service to her customers. To get precise and up-to-date ETAs, Sixfold integrates with all stakeholders, the TMS systems of both shippers and carriers, and the telematics on board. But Sixfold doesn't stop there. We also consider real-time traffic, weather and location information, and analyze historical truck data, which helps us to predict when the delivery truck has to stop and take a break. Alice and Oliver now have full visibility over hundreds of deliveries each day. Their warehouse processes become more efficient, their customer support can now be proactive. They don't need to bother carriers with frequent check calls anymore. And most importantly, their customers are now happier than ever. Sixfold, be in control with real-time visibility. Hi there, everyone. I'm Tunu from Sixfold. We provide the large manufacturers, retailers, um, logistics providers, the Coca-Colas, Nestles and Tesco's of the world, um, predictive visibility over their supply chains in real time. Each of these large companies have hundreds, sometimes thousands of carriers working for them, carrying their goods around the globe. We have the largest fleet of uh, carriers um, and the largest fleet of uh, online trucks uh, connected to our system, plus, um, the, um, pl plus we have integrations with the rail operators, the ocean freight operators, and, and combining all that information that is flowing in in real time, we can provide our shipper customers um, knowledge of where the goods are, when will they arrive, and if any of those will be late or require their attention, so reducing uh, the manual efforts for getting this data over phone or fax or something uh, by magnitudes. And um, we rec recognized among the top global players in our field um, by industry analysts like Gartner, and, uh, and we help our customers optimize their logistics, automate processes, um, reduce costs and cut emissions. Um, you can see, uh, you, you can hear more of that in, in our um, uh, breakout session later, where we also will uh, introduce uh, 
a small peek into the next invention that we are building, a carrier finder, uh, where we match uh, this massive stream of knowledge uh, uh, to locations so that we can always uh, provide shippers um, the best carrier to carry out one load or the best carrier to um, service a certain lane in the globe. And one final thing. Um, so last year we created a free live border map uh, of the congestions uh, in Europe just when the lockdowns of COVID started. And we uh, turned out that we were the only ones with information such like this. Uh, and we re reached the hundreds of thousands of people, logistics people, governments, the general public, and, uh, and helped them out with info that only we had. That's it. being here with us today um, and yeah this this map that uh, circulated last year with with regards to covid and and the uh, the waiting times at the border and so on was was really useful we also saw it at the briefing center of course and people were very impressed i can tell you that um one of the questions that we see from the audience was uh, how does your offering differ from other digital freight forwarders uh, such as insta freight uh, and so on great question insta freight is our customer and we are not digital freight forwarder we um step in where already um, carriers and shippers have a working relationship and we make um, it real-time visible. Otherwise, they would be blind. That's what we do. It's a very quick summary, yeah. Um, can you give more examples of how real-time visibility data can be used in transportation? What are the other use cases? Um, that's an, uh, a deep well of, uh, of different uh, options. Uh, We've got one minute. <laughs> um, all right, let's, let's start from the beginning. So um, Nestle, our, uh, our customer, has operations across uh, Europe and each of these uh, operations is it's kind of regionally um, governed. We uh, help them bring it together, uh, the whole Europe, under one uh, management. So... That's a good example for uh, enter um, enterprises. Very well. So you will also be able to be in touch uh, with Tenu for the later breakout room. So that's very important. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we are heading on to our next presentation, uh, which will be done by Argoverk. He is the head of sales at Ridango, and he will tell us more about what Ridango does these days. Let's take a look. Hello everybody, my name is Argo Berk, I'm head of sales at Tridango. We live in time of significant changes. The world's population is growing rapidly, and so is the number of cars driving on our roads. Congestions and traffic jams are everyday reality in all bigger cities. The mobility challenges are also amplified by urbanization. It is predicted that around 70% of all population on the globe will live in urban areas by 2050. In order to adapt to such changes, the public transport needs to transform as well. And we, as a company, can contribute to that change by making the public transport usage simple and convenient for each person. How do we pay for our rights? Can we make the process more seamless in order to attract more people to use public transport? These are the questions we are working on each day. Ridango is an international IT solution provider for public transport with a focus on ticketing, payment, 
and real-time passenger information systems. Our technology platform is suitable for any transit authority or operator, regardless of the size of the city or region. For example, there are millions of people in Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, who use our ticketing system each day for commuting. We make their life simpler by offering them modern and convenient ways for ticket purchase, validation or top-up. Ridango is also well known for its contactless payment solutions. We were the first company to roll out a contactless bank card acceptance in public transport in Northern Europe when we launched the solution in Malmö region of South Sweden in 2019. And one of our latest innovations is a demand-responsive transport ticketing solution, which offers technology-based relief for many challenges transit authorities are facing when providing paratransit or public transport services in low-density areas. Such on-demand solution allows for increased accessibility for people with mobility needs, which are currently unmet by regular public transport. I will be talking about contactless payments and demand-responsive service also in the breakout room after the panel sessions. Thank you. Thank you so much for being uh, with us here, and thanks for this introduction about what Ridango does. Uh, we already have a question from the audience, um, namely, which direction do you see public transportation and cities overall uh, changing with mobility services? So how, how will all of these solutions shape our lives in cities? I need to say it is a good question <laughs> once again, uh, like many times today already before. I think um, these challenges, these mobility challenges, urbanization, I was talking about, uh, cities need to address these. But on the other hand, the public transport needs to become more personal. Um, I need to use it where I, where I want and when I want. So probably there will be a lot of integrations with uh, different service providers outside of kind of commonly or traditional uh, public transport, like micro, micro mobility uh, or ride hailing, etc. So there will be integrations. But also, on the other hand, uh, I would say that maybe the people mindset needs to change a bit. Mm -hmm. For example, when we talk about the last mile or first mile, maybe we just need to learn how to walk a bit more and not use public transport for last mile at all. At City, uh, in the cities. Oh, walking sounds scary, no, but I think um, I, I fully agree that uh, you know this this um, connection between the the cities and also the more rural regions around the cities mm -hmm. that will be a, a question of life and death for some communities. And the more you adapt and the more you cater to the demands, more individualized transport, as you mentioned, uh, the more likely you are to to be successfully tied into that network, mm -hmm. which I think is very encouraging. Um, maybe maybe one last question uh, you mentioned. You're working in different countries uh, and uh, with, with different transport authorities. What do most of them have in common in terms of the challenges and do they differ in any way? Um, well, the common thing always for, for all the public transport authorities is, is that they desire, they want to make public transport more attractive. Mm. They want to attract more people to use public transport. But the challenges are very different. It comes from the cultural backgrounds, the people habits, legislation, etc. So there are many differences as well. Very good. Uh, thank you so much for that overview. And we are not done with you just yet. So we are now heading, as you can see on Worksup as well, to our very first panel discussion of the day, which will be moderated by Annette Numa, my fellow digital transformation advisor from the Estonia Briefing Center. And she will be joined by Tono Runne and also Argo Verk, who you just saw with their presentations. And they will talk about the future trends in the areas of mobility and goods. So have a great time with that. Good afternoon to everyone also from my side here. I sincerely hope that you have enjoyed these first two presentations by Redango and Sixfold. And we're now going to continue now with our panel discussion on topic of sustainable trends in planning mobility of people and goods. My name is Annette Numa and I work as a digital transformation advisor at the Estonia Briefing Center. 
But now to get to the topic here, one of the most difficult environmental and social challenges is transforming the mobility of people and goods. And this sector is in a process of changing completely drastically. And we can't even predict what is going to happen in the future. But speaking about the real numbers in this sector, mobility will increase as more people and goods will move across towns and across the globe. Just bring it out some of the numbers to you. In 2030, the annual passenger traffic is expected to exceed 80 trillion passenger. You heard it right. 80 trillion passenger, which is 50% increase compared to the year of 2015. And the global freight volumes will grow around by 70% compared to 2015. And in addition to that, 1.2 billion cars will be on the roads, which is double than we have today. I have together with me here two companies uh, whose hard work has a growing potential to improve the lives of millions of people and the environment and the quality of life. And at the same time, it can also help to minimize the effect of the climate change. Thanks for your very interesting uh, overviews of your solutions here. I will gladly now go more in details with your solutions um, where both uh, Ridangoa and Sixfold has been developing. And Argo, I would, I would actually like to start with you here. Um, so Ridango has established a solution um, for public transport uh, with focus on ticketing payment and real-time passenger information systems. You have been implementing solutions in Estonia, in Sweden, in Denmark, Lithuania, even in Ukraine. And clearly, they are very fundamentally different countries. Maybe you can just bring it out some of the most surprising differences and challenges uh, between implementation processes in, in these different areas. Um, yeah, um, as our customers is usually from public sector. It means that uh, all our contracts uh, are awarded through the public procurement. So it all basically the differences start with the procurement process itself. Uh, there are very different rules and regulations in different countries for language use, for uh, different documentations you need to provide, etc. So, so the differences start already there. Um, if I if I talk about the implementation itself, then obviously if both sides put enough effort to the project, then basically it is quite similar from country to country because the solution itself is quite similar what we offer. It is a serial product. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but these are the ones I would bring out now. But would you say that the implementation is easier in a country where the digitalization percentage is a little bit bigger in a way, or if the infrastructure is like ready for, 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 for this kind of system? Well, today the, the infrastructure for our solution mostly means actually uh, the, the mobile network coverage, for mm -hmm. example, because mm -hmm. all the devices and others we bring uh, mm -hmm. from, our, uh, from our own solution. But let's say it, it of course helps because there are then people who understand how the system mm -hmm. should work and it is easier to talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, very important is also what are the people's habits in the country? Mm -hmm. How do they buy tickets? Are there vending machines? Are they used to use mobile applications mm -hmm. already? So it varies very, very uh, largely from country right. to country. I will move over to Danu now. Um, you are the co-founder of, of uh, company Sixfold, uh, Sixfold uh, which is Europe's leading provider for visibility services. And you already helped the world's biggest companies and carriers and, and the customers to get up-to-date information on the estimated delivery times and see also their shipments in absolute real time. Uh, we know that in 2020, when the pandemic hit the world, um, so there were many, many queues at the European borders. And, and of course, we, we saw a very significant distribution with delivery times as well. But Sixfold was a game changer there and, and, and came and helped many different countries and of course also the carriers in a way. Maybe you can elaborate this a little bit more in details and, and, and tell our audience, how did you support countries and, and carriers by the time of pandemic? <clears throat> yeah, this was a free product that we created over a week and actually uh, a good example of how hackathons can work. And... Uh, Therefore, it was, a, it was not a rollout uh, country by country, but instead we built something uh, based on our data, the massive streams from hundreds of thousands of trucks, and uh, visualized the congestions on the borders, uh, uh, how many hours a truck should uh, expect to wait there, um, what's the... Um, what's the uh, length of the queue mm -hmm. and uh, we didn't need to 
contact any government. We didn't need to um, roll anything out. We just built the product and it, uh, it went viral. Um, logistics people, governments, journalists, general public uh, just found it. It's, it was very simple mm -hmm. and they adopted it in their process in various wa ways. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then we were so thankful when you came up with a solution and we could see that this actually influenced this entire delivery process in a way. A cool yeah. um, factoid there. Uh, European Commission is uh, uh, still a user of this system, even though now things are much mm -hmm. better in Europe. Yeah, and hopefully we'll never, uh, we'll never be back in a position where we would have to struggle with the queues at the borders. I, I think so too. Yeah, and thanks for your solution, obviously. Uh, but Argo, now talking to you, we had participants today here from many public institutions who are responsible for organizing the entire transportation system and also ticketing payment systems in their countries, in their cities, municipalities. What would be your advice for them? How to be a smarter customer? So when they, um, when they uh, do the procurements and, 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 and that kind of things, or when they uh, urgently look for solutions, how they could be more demanding customers so that you could deliver better. Uh, do you have any experience or how do you educate your, your, uh, your customers in a way? Yes, I would definitely recommend that before they would come out uh, with a tender itself, they would actually have some sort of a technical dialogue with the ven vendors. Um, I think the vendors bring to the table the understanding the experience, what is available, where the world is moving, what are the solutions and, and possibilities, because sometimes the, the, the wishes of the customers and, and the actual possibilities are not in line. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would definitely recommend that. And also the second thing uh, I think they need to pay attention is that during the whole process, not only the procurement, but also the, the implementation itself, that the, the, the authority itself would put enough effort mm -hmm. um, to the project because it will pay off a lot. Uh, sometimes we see that uh, it's a huge project, there are tens of people from our side working, and there are only one, two people from the authority mm -hmm. side. But we also need the, the feedback, the mm -hmm. testing uh, results, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they need to put in effort. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Dono? Uh, like, uh, speaking of educating your customers, do you do anything like this as well, that you give some kind of feedback or saying like, okay, this is what you should need, so you should ask these yeah. things from us, so we... Uh, it seems that our customers are similar um, in a way. Large organizations uh, in private sector mm -hmm. uh, enterprises, uh, um, maybe the difference is that they are spanning uh, countries and continents. Uh, but again, uh, the success of, uh, of each uh, customer depends uh, heavily on how much investment they put into it in time, attention, and uh, pre-work, uh, pre-sales, uh, business consulting with us. All right. Um, jumping back to Argo now. Um, predicting the changes in public transportation in the future, which direction do you see the public transportation changing? Or, an, or how do change the mindset of people but like for making them use a little bit more public transportation than just their personal cars? Or are there local municipalities for uh, like front, uh, front runners here? Or do you people have to be the demanding part for the changes from the button up or, or how do you feel about that? Um, it may depend from country to country. If we talk about it on a basis of Estonia, then uh, I actually believe that the authorities should be the leading part. Um, I, I think from bottom up, uh, Estonians are not that good for demanding something, mm -hmm. uh, but rather following the lead. Mm -hmm. So I think really the, the spokespersons and uh, and mobilizing, mm -hmm. mobilizing the, the communities, etc. This should come from the, mm -hmm. from the authorities. But whether public transport is changing, like I said already before, I, I see it on one hand, it needs to become more personal. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be um, su suited for me, for my personal needs. So I need to use it when, mm -hmm. where I want uh, this kind of personal touch. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, because of the urbanization, we need to develop more kind of mass transit mm -hmm. uh, options like metros or bus rapid transit mm -hmm. uh, and these would take the heavy load of the commuters mm -hmm. and then it's the question of first mile and last mile and as I said maybe we need to learn walking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, have you ever been uh, working together with uh, with different cities or countries that you see that in, in this city or in this region, like the people are the de demanding ones, like that they are looking for, for, for solutions that it works that way around like? 
Well, it is usually uh, a scope for the authority, so we are not maybe not in that close connection mm -hmm. with the people in this region. But I know that in Sweden, in many cases, they, they, the authorities listen very carefully what people mm -hmm. are saying and, uh, and do all kinds of studies and, uh, and tests and, and ask mm -hmm. their opinions. So mm -hmm. it works in Sweden mm -hmm. well. Uh, but then providing full transparency among sexual customers, consumers, is one of the key strengths that you have. Uh, what kind of data are your customers able to track compared to the other providers uh, that are providing a similar solution that you are? What's the value proposition uh, of your company? Um, the difference comes mainly from uh, where we started. Unlike our competitors, we started as a tech and data science company. So we approached the... Um, uh, it from a different angle and then we teamed up with uh, specialists of uh, mm -hmm. of logistics field um, early on uh, to add the second half to the game and and in the end how we differ is mainly the uh, the extent uh, by now just in three and a half years we've grown uh, to be the biggest uh, network of live uh, live vehicles in europe and uh, and now growing beyond. So um, the technological pace or the, the, the feature sets, they, they are getting closer and closer. In the end, it's a network game. Mm -hmm. uh, who has the widest um, available um, data on the ground? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, now, going back to you, talking about the COVID-19 crisis, uh, I have a question to you, Argo. Mm. How much has the COVID-19 crisis changed the behavior of our travelers? What have been the most outstanding like trends uh, you have seen post-COVID time? Um, yeah, the, the COVID has changed a lot, actually. Uh, if we think about our customers, which are public transport authorities usually, then they have lost 60-70% of passengers mm -hmm. uh, compared to the mm -hmm. pre-COVID time. And um, they are responsible in a way that they actually ask themselves, uh, people not to use public transport mm -hmm. because it comes from the government mm -hmm. and it, it is the same thing to do mm -hmm. at this moment. Uh, but what we see also and, and what probably become a new de facto standard post-COVID is uh, all sorts of contactless solutions. Mm -hmm. So um, most of our customers have stopped any uh, ticket sales on board, so the drivers don't interact with mm -hmm. uh, passengers anymore. So there are contactless bank cards coming to. They were already a trend before the COVID, but now it has uh, kind of increased the pace a lot. Mm -hmm. And we see that these, these kind of methods will become a new de facto standard. Mm -hmm. Um, even like talking about myself, like I, I used to use public transportation very, very often before the crisis, but I was very scared to do so when, when the numbers were increasing, obviously. So, mm -hmm. so it can have a real impact, but I'm also super happy that no one can buy um, the tickets again from the bus driver anymore, but you, you have to swipe your card. Yep. Um, so it makes also everyone's life a little bit safer in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, but continuing on, on, on the pandemic time, I also have a question to you, uh, Dono, um, because providing an absolute real-time visibility uh, of operations is very essential. But when we talk about like, like in the light of the crisis, like COVID-19 pandemic, the stakes are even higher. And it can mean the differences between crucial medical equipment being available uh, or, or also stuck at borders and, or essential products being available in supermarkets uh, as well. Um, so Sixfold is helping many worldwide companies to improve their supply chain pro uh, processes during pandemic. Can you give us some of the examples regarding this? Um, I think a good example here would be um, how medical equipment um, uh, producer Semperit uh, uh, was one of the first companies who uh, embraced our border map uh, last year when the, the real um, um, stress from the congestions was the highest and, uh, and they used our, uh, our information to uh, plan ahead and avoid those congestions mm -hmm. uh, uh, if at all possible because every country has multiple borders and one of them is more congested than the other and they could then uh, plan ahead and get deliveries done. Mm -hmm. but, but thankfully this isn't um, a case anymore. Logistics is resilient and, uh, uh, and, and now that the borders are uh, back to normal um, I don't foresee 
any uh, huge difficulties on that front. Mm, all right. Um, but continuing talking about the numbers, as you know, I love to talk about the numbers. Uh, the highest number of cars per inhabitants was recorded in Luxembourg, followed by Italy, Cyprus and Finland. Estonia is holding a position number six there. And in 2018, Poland had by far the highest share of passenger uh, cars older than 20 years, followed by Estonia and, and Finland. And in 2018, the highest shares of petrol powered cars among the highest registrations were noted in Netherlands, which was 80%, and Estonia followed with Finland uh, with 74 and, and 74.3%. Uh, 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 how do we get these countries that are on top of the uh, list to change their trends to use public uh, transportation instead? Do you see any changes of behavior already in the recent years? Well, I was surprised actually to see that uh, Netherlands is in that list because Netherlands actually has a very good public transport mm -hmm. network. They are really fond of trains and trains cover mm -hmm. the whole country and everybody travel with trains. So probably it has to do something with petrol cars mm -hmm. rather than uh, overall mm -hmm. number of cars per mm -hmm. capita. But if you think about Estonia and Finland, then both of these countries are sparsely populated meaning that there are rural areas where mm -hmm. public transport cannot provide the service which is always available. So I think it is normal that we continue using cars. Mm -hmm. It's not maybe the question how to get people out of cars to use public transport in, in rural areas, maybe in the cities, yes. Mm -hmm. But in rural areas, maybe we can just join forces. Maybe there are some community services that people can share cars mm -hmm. when they go to, I don't know, take their kids to the training or go grocery shopping or whatever. So. Perhaps there are ways to do that. Yeah, well, that, that's one of the choices. Um, also, a little reminder to our audience, you also have a chance to ask your questions, so please to post them into our Q&A section, so I could also ask uh, your questions from, uh, from our uh, speakers here today. But I will continue with, uh, with one of my own questions here. Um, talking about the climate part and the environmental issues, as discussed in the beginning, the climate change and the environmental impact on, of human activity present the very clear challenges for the whole world. Uh, the new digital technologies play a very essential role uh, in pushing sustainable growth. Many companies and countries are seeing sustainable and greener solutions giving co uh, co very competitive advantage and, and looking for a way to reduce c uh, CO2 uh, into the transportation sector. How does Sixfold Solution support the European Union Green Deal uh, goals? That's an easy one. So... Uh a little example, um, if, you, uh, if you're if you using a carrier that uh, has to bring their truck from uh, 100 kilometers to bring your goods uh, to the destination and then they don't have um, another customer lined up there to be, bring that back the truck together with the goods, then you have a lot of empty mileage uh, racking up. and. Um, the further we get with uh, digitalizing the, uh, the European um, supply chains, the more we see that uh, carriers are chosen more optimally, more locally, um, um, and, and they have uh, more options to bring back the truck together with the goods. It's not a direct connection between um, what we do and how uh, how carriers are then reducing emissions. It's a, it's a total network effect then in the end, um, reducing emissions by dozens of uh, percentage points. Um, now, as we already have received a couple of questions from our audience too, I'm going to jump to you, our audience questions too. Uh, what is your biggest challenge when implementing a solution or even turning it at the design stage? GDPR or other regulations, government, public, uh, or lack of uh, interest or something completely different? It's definitely not GDPR because this is kind of um, done already. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are fully compliant with that. But I think the, the biggest challenge would be to to have a good dialogue with a customer. I mean, as I already pointed out, uh, there are quite many still authorities who just write down everything uh, they come up with and then they expect that the vendor should implement it all. But it's, it's not that simple. So it's, it's always to kind of have the creative dialogue before the actual tender 
And of course, it can and it needs to in, uh, include multiple vendors, so gather the knowledge from the market, mm -hmm. and then come up with a with a solution design which is suitable for this region, but also doable by mm -hmm. vendors. Yeah. Um, the other question that I also very much love here is the pandemic did lead us to home office, obviously. Uh, what effect will this have on the long run as we learned that home office actually works? Uh, do you expect people to accept longer uh, commuting distances as they might only travel from time to time to their um, employers? Mm, it is difficult to say, obviously, because this is new situation for, for all of us. But I definitely see that the pandemic, first of all, has uh, taken us back at least a few years in, uh, in the process of uh, attracting more people to public transport. So we are set back by, by a few years at least. And on the other hand, I do acknowledge that this is actually true, that we probably in the future uh, will travel less uh, for the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I, if I think about myself, then I used to travel in average once per week Abroad, uh, abroad. Um, but probably this will not happen because all our customers are also now used to have online conversation. They weren't before. Mm -hmm. So this will probably uh, have an effect in the future as well, yes. All right. Um, now I have the very last question to you, as otherwise we're running out of time here. Speaking now on a very personal level, how do you use, uh, how does your transportation like habits look like? How do you commute between work, uh, be uh, between work and, and home? Like maybe starting from you, Dono. Uh, it's <laughs> a long distance uh, from bed to table. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I expect this to be much more common, not only for me, but for, for the wider uh, general public that uh, we, we will re uh, reduce the commute uh, everybody of us uh, quite significantly who can work from home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to stay uh, not as crazy as now, but in a good way. Uh, yeah, I have al also adapted already to the situation. So I work from home uh, on many days actually throughout the week. But if I need to commute, I actually use a car. Uh, I have to say this because I live outside of Tallinn and it takes about 20 minutes for me to drive to work, but it would take around an hour with the public transport. and. Uh, this is where the difference comes from. But hopefully, uh, as we talked about, the, all the kind of suburban areas will have a better connection in the future as well, so I can switch to public transport. Yeah. I'm otherwise a big fan of trains, by the way. Uh, yeah, if we would have them working a little bit more, and I would say not efficient, but more like uh, quicker and, and, and so that we could go from one place to another a little bit yeah. quicker. Uh, but okay, uh, that's a wrap with the first uh, panel discussion here. I would give now uh, the floor back to my lovely colleague, Florian Marcus, who is gonna uh, also present to the other three uh, companies that we're gonna hear their overviews of their solutions. And I will be back here with a second panel um, quite soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very uh, interesting and very honest and straightforward uh, conversation, uh, both to Annette and, of course, the representatives from our two companies. Uh, without any further ado, we want to go next to uh, our upcoming uh, presentation, which will be done by Gaspar Anton. He is the CEO and founder of IV Technologies, and we will find out what exactly they do in just a second. Let's take a look. Digitization is sweeping across every aspect of our daily lives in all possible ways. We collect more and more information about the physical world. But currently, getting this data in the road infrastructure sector is slow, resource intensive, 
and unsustainable. Backlogs for road maintenance amount to trillions of dollars, and they are still growing. Ivy has developed a solution with advanced AI power on-demand mapping technology. We improve predictive maintenance and safety auditing. We enable road consultants and asset managers to reduce their operating expenses with zero capital expenditure and produce the data they need to support their solutions and services. Ivy, enabling infrastructure digitization. Come and join our journey on mapping the future. Good day. Ivy mission is to make infrastructure management more sustainable by reducing 30% of infrastructure upkeep costs while increasing the safety for each single road user. Through our clients, we are helping the government to use their limited budgets much smarter and towards the future innovations while reducing the number of road accidents increasing the quality of driving experience, and of course, making our environment less polluted and more towards the green and sustainable future. I know this all may sound a bit like fairy tale, but with the magic of 3D data, Ivy is making this fairy tale a reality. Ivy enables for road consultants frequent and detailed overview of the entire physical road networks through our AI-powered mapping platform. Road defects, attributes, road lanes, barriers, safety walls, road signs, overpasses, and so on, so on. Everything necessary for predictive road maintenance, road asset and traffic management, safety auditing, autonomous transportation, and more. It may come as a surprise to you, but already today, every single road section is being mapped over and over and over to acquire all this data. It is being done with inefficient, outdated and expensive technologies, or with slow, manual and inaccurate solution, while this need is heavily growing, and that's where Ivy Technologies will rock. We are a spin-off startup, nine months since our foundation, most amazing team behind all the magic, and we have been heavily growing. Our software-as-a-service, mileage-based approach is giving our clients return of investment in every single project they conduct. And that's why we have already been in action in Estonia, Finland, Sweden, Poland, UK, France, and even US. While our software platform is heavily supported by our portable mobile mapping hardware set that we include in our software package. So in case our clients don't have their own hardware, we will send you one. And in every country we operate, we formulate long-term partnerships with leading road consultant companies who are trusted and reliable partners for the government and who are unleashing our magic towards the digital transformation. We and our clients sharing the same mission to make the road infrastructure management more sustainable. So please join us in the breakout room or after the event to listen more about IVTech or even to listen about our startup roadmap. We are fundraising, we are growing our team. My name is Kasper Anton, founder and CEO of Five Technologies, and I welcome you. Come join our crusade for mapping the future. Thank you so much for that introduction to uh, what you do, what Ivy Tech does, uh, and so much more. We already have questions from the audience, and one actually refers back to a topic that was uh, mentioned in one of the previous presentations as well. Uh, it's about digital twins. So okay. how can digital twins be used for more effective city management and also potentially forecasting the future? Can you give us an insight into that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, since Estonia just uh, released their, their digital in almost the entire country, it's actually very cool and amazing. Good show of everyone who was involved. Uh, to give you an example, I would, uh, I would tell you about my childhood video game, Sim City, if everybody remembers. It's something that you start building city from the scratch. You build it, roads, uh, infrastructure, buildings, hospitals, schools, so on, so on. When your city is expanding, you find finally yourself that you want to make changes. 
you want to change the infrastructure, you want to change uh, rail station to the new place, you want to add something. And in the game, what you do is you take this eraser and you scratch it off, build something new. In real life, that's not an option. We know that what we build today will last for decades. So it gives a huge pressure to the city officials how to make today the decisions, taking into account decades of developments ahead and every variables. This is something that digital teams will enable, that you can play through scenarios of the decisions today, understanding the impact and then making the right ones for the greater good of the future. Uh, I very much enjoyed that SimCity <laughs> example, and I can very much relate. Uh, I'm sure that many people uh, watching, uh, whether at home or at work uh, right now, can also relate. Um, thank you so much uh, for, for your insight and uh, t uh, sharing with us uh, what Ivy Tech does. Um, and of course, as uh, he's already said, please join in the breakout room afterwards. And also another encouragement, it's great to see so many questions uh, from the audience. Please keep them coming. They're very enjoyable indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Gaspar, for being with us. Thanks. And we are heading over to our next presentation already, uh, which is done by Mart Zurkask. He is the CEO at Bergman Technologies, and they make roads and cities smarter. Let's take a look. Globally, pedestrian injuries and fatalities are slowly on the rise. Reports point to smartphone distraction, poor lighting and bad judgment as possible key factors. For drivers, roads are as safe as they have ever been. For people on foot, roads keep getting deadlier. The Smart Pedestrian Crosswalk is a modular traffic control device that aims to protect vulnerable road users. Our smart sign monitors the movement of pedestrians and vehicles in the vicinity. When a crossing pedestrian and an oncoming vehicle are detected, an instant V2X warning message is sent to the vehicle. In addition, warning lights on the pole activate to notify the driver about any road user about to cross or already crossing the street. Another driver notified, another life saved. Did you know that traffic accidents cost countries on average 3% of their national GDP? Imagine for a second if we could capture this productivity and imagine that no one will die or get hurt on our roads anymore. This feels good, right? So what is stopping us of achieving this uh, dream? Is it the, the, the way we have designed our roads? Is it the vehicles? Or perhaps it's us, the road users? Whatever the roadblock has been, there's a systemic change coming, which is extremely likely to succeed in eliminating traffic fatalities forever. By, for example, the advancements in self-driving vehicle technologies are finally reaching maturity. But vehicles alone can't fix everything. So static infrastructure needs to catch up as well. My name is Mart Surgaisk. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Bergman Technologies, focused on innovation and digitalization of traffic safety. I truly believe that we can reduce traffic fatalities to almost zero. And I'd love to share with you how we can make this happen. To combat high number of pedestrians still getting hit by the vehicles on unregulated crosswalks, we have developed a system called Smart Pedestrian Crosswalk. It's designed to increase pedestrian security and safety while crossing the road. But because we are detecting all the road users around, we can also do two very important things. Firstly, we can collect data about road user mobility. For example, pedestrian counting, directional counting, vehicle counting, vehicle classification, speed measurements, etc. But secondly, we are developing algorithms to actively prevent potentially hazardous situations, to actually save someone's life. We feel that this functionality, when pioneered to be cost-effective and retrofitable to existing infrastructure, will become a new normal uh, in five to ten years. By the way, all this calculation and processing is happening uh, within the system itself, so no internet connection is really needed. We just use mobile data uh, to send out uh, information from the crosswalk. 
As of today, we have installed and shipped our products to uh, Estonia, United Kingdom, and Croatia. The smart pedestrian crosswalk can also talk with connected and autonomous vehicles, so we are working closely with industry partners to be ready when to transmit standardized safety messages to vehicles. Um, our products benefit people directly through increased traffic safety. Cities and municipalities benefit from this new source of data and by putting technologies to good use for people's well-being and uh, longer lifespan. If you are facing challenges you heard today, I would love to meet you in the breakout room and uh, discuss a little bit further how we can help as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mart, for, uh, for being with us and giving us an overview of what you do at Bergman Technologies. Um, I guess the first question that was on my mind is, are you working with any other research institutes or how, how is your, uh, your work based? Like, what, what do you base it on? Yeah, of course. Um, we are inventing the future, but also working very closely with research institutes. For example, we are working with uh, uh, Technology University here in, in Tallinn. Uh, regarding communication uh, from infrastructure to vehicles, etc., but also human and vehicle interactions. And we are working with uh, one of the local Estonian universities, University of Tartu, regarding um, also self-driving vehicles and their communication with this static infrastructure. It's always good to have some sort of uh, ac uh, academic grounding uh, in the work that you do. Uh, one more question, looking a bit more into the future, uh, when do you expect the traffic to be fully automated? Uh, a bit unlike what we see today. Uh, it's a very good question. And um, I think, first of all, there will be a very long uh, transition time uh, when vehicles firstly become connected to each other mm -hmm. with infrastructure. So it's very, very hard to tell exactly when it will be fully automated. It might not be ever fully automated in, in certain places, but there is a very, very it's very likely that in, in 10 years, we can say that um, uh, it's uh, actually like almost automated. Very much looking forward uh, to the future, and I'm sure Bergman Technologies is going to be a part of that as well. Mar, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. Uh, we are heading over to our final presentation for now before we then head on to the breakout rooms. Uh, so uh, next on stage, we have uh, Tavi Reivas, who is the chairman at Alvatech, and he will tell you more about what Alvatech does. Hi, I'm Tavi and I'm representing Overtech. We are developing and producing autonomous vehicles that take you from the bus stop to your doorstep, or for that matter, any place you want to go in a predetermined area. By doing that, we actually also reduce the need for parking lots that take up a lot of valuable uh, a city space, and of course it goes without saying that our way of transport, which is extending public transport, is very much uh, contributing also to achieving the climate goals. 
all of our cars are fully electric. Our car is um, for level four autonomous, which means that it can drive on both uh, public uh, roads and also um, closed roads, depending on the use case. Our car fits up to uh, eight people. And uh, the most important thing is that it is available already now. We have been operating commercially in uh, several countries, uh, mainly in European Union. Uh, Overtech, um, Overtech uh, has a uh, very important um, competitive advantage, and this is uh, being flexible. Uh, there are several use cases for autonomous shuttles, and uh, if a customer needs to modify the car according to a special use case, we are able to do that, mainly because we have both the design, development, and also um, production all done in-house. The second competitive advantage is something that has already been mentioned here today, but is somewhat unusual because it has almost never been uh, you know, used as, as a logical explanation. And, and this is Estonian weather. Uh, we do have four different uh, seasons, and for developing um, different conditions for autonomous vehicles, this is extremely useful. Having a lot of snow, having sometimes heavy rain, having all sorts of conditions helps us to be ready for whatever the world brings. As said, autonomous driving is no longer a distant moonshot. It is here and now, and Overtech is ready for the early adopters to take it along. I would be very happy to explain more in our breakout room soon. Thank you. Davi, thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, you've already given us a great overview of what uh, Alvatech does. Uh, one of the questions from the audience is, um, I guess it's a, it's a common theme these days, uh, what are the biggest barriers for introducing self-driving vehicles uh, on our streets? Mm -hmm. um, would you say it's rather people's mindsets, uh, legal questions, or something completely different? It's both uh, the acceptance by the society, but also legal issues. Uh, uh, I don't think that any of us is completely ready to accepting driving 100 kilometers an hour without the car wheel uh, just in front of us uh, as, as our first experience in an autonomous vehicle. That's why we are uh, having our sweet spot uh, at this last mile uh, transport, which is uh, relatively slow, up to 25 kilometers. The cars are very safe. Uh, you have seat belts. The experience is uh, made as, uh, as safe, as, as, as feeling safe mm -hmm. as humanly possible for people. And, and uh, I think gradually we are growing to have more autonomous driving, uh, but it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, it doesn't indeed, and I'm, I'm sure that this is only the first step, and at some point, we maybe in 50 years or so, we will be much more comfortable with uh, being in a car where there is no steering wheel uh, in front of us at all anymore, uh, and then we can go higher speeds and, and other things. Um, one question uh, that, that also came, came here uh, for, for my side was, so you've tested in Estonia? Uh, you've also tested in Greece, as far as I'm uh, aware. Is there any environment uh, which you really want to test? Like, is there a certain country where you would say, we would love to test there as a test bed as well? Uh, for example, the Gulf area or, or um, uh, Middle East or areas where, where the temperatures are very high, mm. up to, let's say, 50 degrees of Celsius. We want to test out how the car performs uh, in... Uh, uh, when, when the battery is drained by the air conditioner. Of course, we do have some solutions for that as well, but we are not routinely testing there. Mm. Having said that, uh, you know, this winter that we just had, with minus 25 degrees, with piles of snow, with sometimes this kind of salty, muddy uh, snow, which is, you know, even for human driver, it's, yeah. it's not not pleasurable thing. Uh, our cars uh, enjoy the environment and we're perfectly capable in driving this. Very well. Um, thank you so much, Davi, for giving us thank an you, overview Florian. of what Alvatech does. And uh, now, dear audience, you have seen all the different companies on stage that give you a bit of an idea of what they are responsible for, what they're experts in. Uh, and we are soon heading over to our breakout rooms where uh, you can talk to all of these different companies a bit more in depth. And they will give you uh, a sneak peek of uh, how it actually all works underneath the hood. Um, before I will let you go towards the breakout rooms, uh, a bit more housekeeping to do. Uh, just a kind reminder, we will send you the recordings via email to everybody who registered beforehand. Um, I would like to generally thank you for all the questions, both for uh, all the different 
Uh, yes, uh, so all, all the different uh, questions from the audience, of course, but we still do have the panel discussion before, and that's the <laughs> last thing, um, you're already getting scared, and that's the last thing uh, that we will, of course, do before the breakout rooms. So we will uh, again be joined by uh, Annette Numa, who will be the moderator for this uh, webinar, uh, for, the, for this uh, conversation, uh, and she will be joined by Gaspar Anton, Mart Surkask, and also Davi Raivas. So have fun. And hello once again. We are back with a second panel here. And the second panel is going to focus on building a safer and more innovative transportation system. I'm joined here by Bergman Technologies, Ivy and Awitek. And we all know that transport security has become more sensitive problem that affects all kind of transport users and of course also the providers. I think it should be a basic right to be able to travel without any kind of fear to be to, or to become a victim of, of any kind of accident while having also a very great time and experience as a passenger or a pedestrian. The number of deaths and injuries remains very high and that's why the European Union has adopted Division Zero and also the safe system approach to decrease the number of deaths and serious injuries on the road. The Commission has been very active in promoting different rules and standards and organizing, of course, also different campaigns to raise awareness here. My first question to our speakers today uh, from Bergman, Ivy and Avetek is that can you elaborate in a couple of sentences only? How does your company support the European Union goal to reduce the number of deaths and injuries by 50% as it's stated by the year of 2030? Maybe we can start with you here. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree that uh, road safety is the most important aspect of our transportation. So I'm happy that Ivy is able also to help uh, to build our, our uh, safer traffic. It starts from building safe road infrastructure. And that's where we are enabling the 3D data to analyze the visibility, analyze the safety objects or the lack of them, analyze the, the traffic models and so on. This all gives enough insights to understand blind spots and improve. And maybe we can move all the way to Mark. Maybe you can talk about uh, how does your company um, improve the system that we could have less debts uh, uh, by, by the year 2030? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, what Kaspar is saying about the blind spots. And um, this is what we do. Uh, we try to detect all the road users and try to see in advance where they are going to be heading. Of course, this is somewhat taking the responsibility away from the road user, but at the same time, we need to know. If we want to eliminate traffic fatalities, then this uh, is one of the very crucial aspects. And also from our side, uh, we think that the communication between all the traffic entities is very, very important uh, part. And I know that also your solution helps to analyze later on when some accidents have been happening, but we were going to go to the details with, uh, with this a little bit later. Uh, Tavi, maybe you can also add, add just very shortly uh, about the Alvitec. Two things. First of all, autonomous driving is safer, uh, especially when you use uh, predetermined uh, 3D maps, when you use uh, smart infrastructure. Uh, the situation awareness of autonomous vehicles is much better than any humans. Mm -hmm. He can see 360 degrees, uh, sense uh, distances automatically, do lots of calculations mm -hmm. that neither none of us uh, can do. But also, talking about injuries, uh, especially during a student winter, the biggest injuries are actually people falling at the streets. Mm -hmm. So... Um, or the most common injuries, mm -hmm. let's say. And this is also something if we provide uh, last mile uh, transport to those um, areas where, let's say, elderly people move, again, we can skip a lot of uh, injuries in, in mm -hmm. very difficult uh, weather conditions. But I would continue with you, David. As we know that the Vision Zero requires much safer vehicles, safer infrastructure, lower speeds, and better post-crash care. Um, so Overtech is developing autonomous transportation system, um, and, and you provide an alternative means of transportation and traffic environment that should be, first of all, safe. Uh, secondly, smart, and of course, also sustainable. Now, when we are focusing on these three words that I just mentioned, how are the autonomous vehicles 
providing a safer environment. And do you think that our passengers are ready to drive in a shuttle without any kind of driver and how they can trust the AI technology to do all the work? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question because it's not the technology that's the bottleneck. It's usually the overall acceptance of the society and also legislation, of course. And I do believe that legislation uh, has to move gradually and slowly with the experience uh, developing. So uh, that's the reason why we are at the kind of slow and today's end of, um, of autonomous transportation, because this is ready uh, also to be accepted by the society. Mm -hmm. People have a pleasurable experience driving slowly with seat belts uh, uh, without the risk of, of actually having a fatal accident. Uh, whereas driving 100 kilometers hours from one city to another fully autonomously, it takes time to, to accept this as well. Uh, but I, I assure you that also driving very fast, actually the cars are capable. Uh, it's more uh, the question of whether we as passengers or, or our legislators are ready to accept that. All right. Uh, but now again, uh, bringing out some of the numbers. Um, so let's talk about um, when we compare the numbers of the previous years, a fewer people have lost their lives on the European roads in 2019. An estimated two uh, uh, 22,800 people died in road crashes in 2019, which is around 7,000 fewer than in, in the year 2010. And, and the decrease has been around 23% there. Uh, Europe today remains the safest region in the world when uh, it comes to road safety in a way. And the European Commissioner for Transport has stated that they want to see 50% less deaths and, and serious injuries by the 2030, as I said before. So she's very much convinced that this target is achievable in a way. She also referred that enhancing the combination of uh, legislative measures, funding standards uh, for vehicles, and, and of, of course also the infrastructure, and not to mention the entire digitalization process. Do you think that this goal is achievable? And I would, I would refer this question to you, to Mart especially, and, and maybe you can also talk about that you have been developing your solution in, in a couple of different countries. So um, I had a very great discussion with one of your uh, colleagues who brought out the experience that you had in Finland. Um, so first of all, the question is, is this goal achievable? And, and, and maybe you can just also bring out some of the examples of development process in, in different countries. Yeah, thank you. Um, the problem with the statistics um, is that we are Europe, we are 7,000 fatalities, um, let's say, away from what we what the European European Union wanted by 2020. So even if it's you know slowly uh, going better, the improvements have kind of flatlined. So we are falling behind of our safety targets. And um, because we are falling behind our safety targets, we need to really uh, accelerate some, some other processes to, to catch up. And uh, that's why we think that the technology have a very, very great impact and in, in cooperation as well. Like all the different stakeholders, they must come together, all the technology providers, uh, they need to work towards the same goal as, as one basically. And um, yeah, what we were piloting one of our, our previous generation products in, uh, in Helsinki. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, fun stories from, from that period, because it was f for us as well a learning, learning time. Uh, learning time to what it means to develop hardware, what it means to develop custom software for it, mm -hmm. uh, what it means to interact with people, uh, how many different uh, cases th there is um, when interacting people, like every person is interacting differently um, and, uh, and, and so on. So, yeah, um, we piloted the first, second generation smart pedestrian crosswalk in Finland uh, and we learned a lot of good lessons, mm -hmm. which now have uh, concluded in terms of uh, third generation smart pedestrian crosswalk and uh, yeah, we are we are very happy with uh, with the piloting process mm -hmm. itself and what we learned from that. 
Yeah, and I especially heard like the feedback that you collected from the users, like the citizens that had to be walking on the streets there were like very, very essential for you, again, in order to make this solution even better. And I think this is how, how we should be operating. Uh, but now, Kasper, uh, to you. So Ivy makes road infrastructure digitalization much more sustainable and, and cost effective. And there are a number of different solutions that you offer. Um, I don't know, just starting from a traffic management system, we can see the conditions of the road, hardware, sensors, navigation, data sets, um, and, and of course also innovative 3D, uh, digital twins for cities. Um, today Estonia actually has a fully 3D uh, model of all structures located both above and, and below the ground. How to use digital twins for effective city management and forecasting the future? Yeah, thanks. Um, like I was a bit referred before that it's uh, simulating the, the future scenarios. And, and I think uh, Estonia has, uh, has made something great to showcase that uh, not many countries can say to have this data set available for the entire country area. So uh, taking this data set and now using it as our geospatial transformation and building up these uh, layers of digital data on top of that will help to start simulating not only the city, but, but uh, many aspects of, of uh, our everyday lives. I really believe that uh, I'm a very strong believer, of course, that, uh, that uh, all efficiency will lie on the analyzing of the data. And uh, that's definitely one way to go. So great job, Estonia. Yeah. And, and, and one of the reasons why I invited especially these three companies here into this panel here is because uh, in order to make one of their solutions to work, they need to have the other solution working in a way. So maybe you can just, um, like whoever wants to talk about, like how is your cooperation between you guys uh, yeah. being also organized in a way? So I, I know that in order to make autonomous vehicles to work, we, we also need um, a solution that is provided by Ivy. Um, so I don't know, maybe someone mm -hmm. of you wants to talk about that. Well, I, I can start. Uh, yeah, it's always as, good uh, to have a client <laughs> insight. Exactly, <laughs> as, as our tech uh, has been using um, IV uh, 3D maps mm -hmm. or uh, for for our driving. Uh, in principle, it's possible to do it without uh, the pre uh, pre mapped uh, as well. But it's so much safer to use the map uh, to increase the situation awareness of the car. So the car, while it's driving, doesn't need to calculate so much, doesn't need to measure so much. I mean, some of the things uh, like we, we avoid doing uh, in real time and, and thus we become so much safer, so much, uh, mm, like, yeah, I, I think safety is, is, the, is the most important uh, key aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And also we have been uh, discussing also with Berkman what kind of solutions would uh, help our cars that, that they are providing and something I believe that are actually very important are how to get rid of blind spots. Just like humans also, mm -hmm. autonomous vehicles, they can't do miracles, they cannot see around the corner for example. If there is a building, it needs to stop and look uh, around the corner with the uh, lidars or, or cameras. This can be actually avoided if there is a lighter or whatever sensor um, up on the lamppost that sends the signal that uh, there is a car approaching from the left, mm -hmm. but you have seven seconds or that calculation can mm -hmm. basically be done by the car uh, himself. Mm -hmm. So this kind of combined solutions will take actually our services to next level. And, and uh, it's definitely wise to work together with different uh, very good Estonian companies. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add something? As yeah, well? I would add that. Uh, yeah, it's definitely great to work with uh, some of this innovation and technology company, Avatech, and provide them the digital infrastructure. Uh, but yeah, it's important to understand that already today, the, our roads are living two lives. So we have a physical roads that we all have seen, but the digital side of the road infrastructure is growing. And while we reduce the traffic in the physical side, our uh, traffic in the digital side is going exponentially up. And that's something that all the road authorities and transport agencies need to start considering. Mm -hmm. The road infrastructure will be a combination of these two quite soon already. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, another reminder uh, to the audience, again, once again, you can ask questions too. And we already have received a couple of questions from our audience, uh, which I'm going to read to our, uh, our speakers here. So we're living in an aging society. So the baby boomer generation in Europe will retire around 2030. At uh, the moment, this generation will give up on driving licenses, will autonomous driving, li uh, driving uh, then enable the autonomous living outside of the cities. 
Will these cars be available, affordable, and fully operating on any sort of a road? I guess this question is, is for, for Davi. Uh, yes, they will. Uh, and uh, what makes them uh, affordable in a way is um, uh, the, uh, no need for human driver. I mean, if you compare with the, uh, co the, old, the overall cost of, of transportation, the human driver is still a considerable uh, part of it. And uh, this we can uh, skip with autonomous driving. Uh, today we still need uh, uh, legally uh, a human to be able to take over whenever the autonomous vehicle is driving. But this can be done remotely via teleoperation. This can be done uh, in such a way that one human is taking care of, let's say, 10 cars or a fleet of cars. So uh, yes, this will be available. And, and, uh, and as we are speaking right now, there are autonomous vehicles uh, driving in Estonia and, and several other countries. All right. Uh, now I have a question to Mart, uh, to you. Uh, so I know that municipalities usually have some priorities uh, in, in choosing which areas to start with implementing your uh, smart pedestrian crosswalk solutions. Um, maybe you can just talk about like uh, what have been your experiences, like how they have ch chosen the exact like areas where they would like to start with. Uh, have there been any kind of trends in there? Yeah, um, usually the requests are coming in uh, where the most vulnerable road users are, uh, namely children, uh, bicycles, uh, and, and so on. So we, I think we have like four, 40 to 50 percentage of those smart pedestrian crosswalk systems um, are requested to be near kindergartens or schools, to be exact. And um, I think one of, the, one of the main reasons is that our product is a perhaps a good alternative for a traffic light, and also with the functionality I touched upon in my in my uh, speech before, mm -hmm. which is this hazardous situation detection. Um, we use cameras, and at the moment we use also the radars to combine the data and understand where everybody are and where are they heading to. Mm -hmm. So we need we are aware uh, one or two two seconds in, before it happens. Mm -hmm. So we can react uh, really mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. And um, from the research, it is said that uh, 750 milliseconds is what one road user needs mm -hmm. to have this accident mm -hmm. or, or uh, prevent it. And I know that also you have some very ambitious plans for the future uh, in order to like I would say, increase the communication uh, with emergency response center. In a most enthusiastic scenario, how would this look like? Yeah, as we, as we, as we know, um, European Union now requires all new cars to have this e-call option. So if you crash your car, it automatically calls the emergency response. And uh, what we want to do is the same thing, but from the infrastructure point of view. Mm -hmm. It's not a very big problem here in Estonia that uh, if one, someone is get, getting hit by the car uh, on the crosswalk, that the car leaves. But in some other countries in Europe, the rate of um, hit and run is 40 percentage. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a lot of people just hitting the people and running away. So, and also the statistical point of view, if we can automatically detect the accident and let the uh, automatically emergency services know, the response time would uh, come down around 40 percentage, which can be a uh, matter of uh, life and death. This can really got some impact on there, and I, I can't wait for, for that time to this to work. Uh, but a question to you, uh, all of our speakers here, uh, very shortly. When do you, we expect the traffic to be fully automated? Just any kind of time. Uh, <laughs> it's a very, very difficult question, as uh, this is a uh, human action uh, topic, uh, human uh, acceptance topic, uh, not so much technology topic, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, as an optimist, I would say that uh, we are talking about, let's say, the let's say 20, 10 to 15 to 20 years. Uh, it depends on you know what what means fully automated, uh, but it can at least be fully automated by that time. Will it be difficult to say because the the, the changes don't happen overnight? But what we will see definitely is public transport uh, uh, lorries. Uh, uh, extension of public transport last mile, uh, both in people and, and uh, goods delivery, this will be uh, uh, fully autonomous uh, much sooner than the rest mm -hmm. of the transport. 
any time for you guys? <laughs> I would just uh, add on that uh, it's very difficult to predict and, and uh, I don't predict future, I, I enable it. <laughs> so uh, whenever it happens, Ivy, thanks to Ivy, it will happen sooner. <laughs> All right, and uh, we have to detect and predict. So um, <laughs> our, our idea is that uh, in 10 years, it's very likely that uh, you can't um, get your technical, um, uh, technical passport for your vehicle if you don't have the communication module. And of course, I think 20 years uh, is when you can't really steer uh, on your own in the, in the cities, for example. Before we go to the very last question that I have for you, I, I also wanted to talk about the cyber attacks because we know that they are continuously becoming a stronger weapons. And, and when we would have fully automated and autonomous traffic, it has its risk factors too. How do you ensure that the safety has been provided in our tech? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, if, uh, if there is an attack happening and, and, and we have a bus that has no driver, how do you make sure that I can trust this? Again, I very much like this question as, as to, like, always if foreigners look at e-Estonia or Estonian e-service, also the government services, sometimes they see that, okay, but there are risks. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are, of course, but we address the risks and, and we take note of the risks. So, so uh, there is no such thing as perfect world. And, and if we know what the risks are, we can uh, easily take care of them. Now, for our buses... Uh, uh, they are connected. They, they use mobile uh, network, uh, ideally 5G, but uh, in real life uh, it's mostly 4G. Uh, and if they lose connection, mm -hmm. they are programmed to stop uh, safely, no problem. Mm -hmm. This is the most easy cyber attack, if I may say, just jamming the mm -hmm. connection. Now, uh, but th not, nothing bad will happen because of that. Now, more serious thing is if somebody attempts to take over uh, the uh, teleoperation of the car. But this is something that we have been uh, heavily investing in to uh, enable safe, uh, secure channels between car and mm -hmm. teleoperation. Mm -hmm. And again, the car can be programmed if it detects that, that there is some um, malfunction, some hostile activity, it can be programmed to stop slowly and just you know, lock itself in a way. Right. So yes, of course, we need to address those topics. Uh, we're running out of time, but I still want to ask my very last question. So you only have one single sentence. <laughs> so a question to all of you. Uh, with one sentence, what is the added value of your business to build a safer and more sustainable traffic environment? Let's start from here, Kasper. <laughs> Towards the safe and sustainable road infrastructure management through data-driven analytics. Yeah, for us as well, um, providing uh, and gathering the data and also uh, saving lives. Being able to uh, use more public transport instead of personal cars uh, enables to save immense amount of uh, CO2 emissions and also save valuable uh, city space uh, to be used better than parking lots. Thank you for your fantastic answers, and I really enjoyed this panel discussion with you. Um, now, that's a wrap for the second panel, too. So uh, I would like to thank everyone that listened to us uh, and, and listened to these two panels. And um, I would now give the floor over back to my colleague, Florian, who would sum it up and then will give some kind of uh, information how uh, will these uh, uh, breakout group sessions to look like as well, because some great news for you. That wasn't your, your last chance to hear these companies talking, but you can also join them to the breakout room sessions and, and hear a little bit more in details, ask your own questions and have a discussion there too. So I would like to thank you from my side and I wish you a very nice day. Yes, uh, thank you so much, uh, Annette, and of course to the companies as well for this uh, splendid panel discussion. I think uh, I learned a few things as well. And I'm sure that you did as well. Um, this whole event was organized uh, with the target of finding your mobility master plan. And uh, I think that we've seen many different companies present, uh, share their thoughts, uh, also provoke your thoughts um, with, with how the future of transportation and mobility can look. Uh, and I'm uh, really hoping that you had a very good time uh, with these first presentations. As was already mentioned, uh, we will soon head over to the breakout rooms where you can talk to the companies in greater detail. And
and depth. Uh, before that, just one last reminder, the recording will be sent to you via email. We are very grateful for your questions in general. And of course, if you want to experience uh, what this uh, futuristic mobility life looks like, you're always invited uh, either to book a presentation with the Estonia Briefing Center or to visit us here in Tallinn and Estonia more widely. Uh, it's a lovely country. Uh, I'm a foreigner here myself, so I can confirm that it's a very nice place to be. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're very much looking forward to having you here uh, as well. Uh, without any further ado, uh, please enjoy the breakout rooms. For the transition, we will show you a small video about our digital expo where you can find out more details about what other uh, companies have to offer in Estonia. <laughs> 